This video is made possible by donations to the United States Lighthouse Society from people like you. Everybody, thank you once again for attending uh, one of our virtual events here. This is going to be a great one. I know a lot of you have attended these events in the past. Uh, and uh, for anybody who doesn't know, I'm Jeremy Dontremont. I'm the historian for the U.S. Lighthouse Society. I host the Society's podcast, Lighthearted. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And of course, we have our special guest, uh, Pete Lero, who I'm going to interview, uh, I'm going to not interview, this is not a podcast, uh, be uh, introducing uh, Pete in just a few minutes. But I want to mention that the executive director of the U.S. Lighthouse Society, Jeff Gales, is with us today. Hello, Jeff. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, Pete. <laughs> hey, how you doing? So, uh, Jeff, uh, I think you'll be taking part in the Q&A period uh, towards the end. So, uh, good to have you yeah. here today. You, you know you can't shut me up. <laughs> uh, as much as I try. <laughs> You're right. But anyway, so uh, this event is being recorded. And we'll be posted on YouTube uh, probably on Monday. Uh, and uh, if you miss part of it or whatever, if you want to see it again, uh, you can see it on YouTube on the USLHS YouTube channel. You can tell your friends if they miss it. Uh, that's uh, an easy way for them to see it. I want to remind everybody, I think you all have, it looks like you all have your mics muted right now, which is great. You should not be unmuting your microphones during this event. There will be an opportunity for people to speak in the Q&A period. We'll explain that when we get to it. But uh, otherwise, keep your mics muted and do not try to share your screens. The only person sharing a screen today will be Pete. Uh, so please don't do that. As I said, we will have Q&A at the end, so everybody have a chance to ask questions. You can enter questions during uh, Pete's presentation, and you can uh, do that in the chat. We'll get to them at the end, or uh, there will be an opportunity to verbally ask questions, as I said. Uh, and uh, again, I just want to mention a little bit more about the podcast, Lighthearted, two words, Lighthearted, the podcast of the U.S. Lighthouse Society that I host. We have some really interesting episodes uh, coming up. They're always posted on Sundays, and this Sunday's episode is going to be an interview with Edward Pepit. Ed Pepit is the host of the uh, ALK, uh, the Association of Lighthouse Keepers organization in England, in the UK. He is the host of their podcast, uh, Keeping Watch, and he's a really interesting guy. He just had a bicycle, did a bicycle ride to every lighthouse in England and Wales over 100 days. He rode his bike to 327 lighthouses, so... Is uh, really, really interesting. So catch that this coming Sunday. And the two Sundays after that will be a two-part interview with Wayne Wheeler, the founder of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. So you don't want to miss that. Uh, I was just out in Washington for about a week uh, recently and had the chance to talk to Wayne. So that's pretty special. So be sure to check that. If you don't know how to listen to the podcast, uh, go to news news.uslhs.org news.uslhs.org they're all on there or use any podcast app on a smartphone uh, apple podcast spotify or whatever and you can hear it that way also want to quickly mention uslhs tours uh, the society of course does tours uh, around the u.s and around the world i will be co-leading a tour in maine october 6th to 12th uh, maine and new hampshire southern maine uh, and it's going to be a great tour. There's still room. If you want to sign up for that, go to uslhs.org to read more about that and all the tours and all the other things, uh, of course, the society offers. Now, I'm going to go ahead and interview. I keep saying interview. <laughs> I already interviewed you, Pete, for the podcast back. Uh, I was just looking it up. It was, believe it or not, it was over three years ago. It was wow. episode 103 of the podcast, and Jeff Gales also took part in that interview. Uh, so if people want to hear more of Pete talking about his amazing photography career, you can find uh, episode 103 of Lighthearted, the podcast. 
but I'm not interviewing to you today, but let me go ahead and introduce you before you get into your presentation. Mm -hmm. Pete Lero is a graduate of Temple University in Pennsylvania, where he studied video, audio, and photography. In his career as a photographer, Pete has done work for the Department of Homeland Security, the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, and USA Gymnastics, among others. When he's not on assignment, he organizes photo workshops around the country. Of course, we'll be hearing more about that. With Pete, <laughs> I can't speak today. With Pete's unique workshops, guests can expect special access, private photo sessions, and a night of professional photography seminars. During some of the workshops, for example, railroads and museums are rented out for the evening, and there's always one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction with Pete for the guests taking part in the workshop. Among Pete's events coming up this year are Lighthouse Photo Workshops on Long Island, New York, in Oregon and in California. There's also a special one in the works to photograph the famous twin lights on Thatcher Island, Massachusetts. During these workshops, participants learn how to take great pictures at night by utilizing the light of the moon and stars. Pete has done a series of lighthouse, quote, lighthouse keeper photos utilizing a reproduction, reproduction uh, lighthouse service uniform and props like a handheld lantern and a spyglass. Participants in his lighthouse workshops get a chance to feel like they're stepping back in time by creating unique photos like these, and we'll be seeing some of that today. Today, we will be mostly talking about Pete's lighthouse photography, but he photographs a lot of other things as well. His portfolio includes landscapes, railroads, cityscapes, historical reenactments, portraits, and more, and I hope we'll be able to get into some of that today, but mostly we'll talk about the lighthouse photos. You can see many of his photos and find out more about the workshops on his website at Lero, L-E-R-R-O, LeroPhotography.com. Before I turn it over to Pete, I'll just mention again, we'll do Q&A at the end. And if, during uh, Pete's talk, if you want to enter your questions in the chat, go ahead. But of course, we won't get to the questions until the end of Pete's uh, presentation. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Pete. So when you're ready, you can go ahead. Well, you can maybe you want to do an introduction before you're, you share your screen, Pete. But anytime you're ready, you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay, give me a sec here. All right. Everybody see? Yep. All right. So, uh, hello, everyone. So, I've been uh, photographing lighthouses since 1999. That's actually when I got my start in photography. Uh, started on a class trip to New York City to the top of the World Trade Center. And I uh, had a throwaway camera that I didn't like the pictures from. So my my father showed me how to use his old Minolta 35 millimeter camera. And then that summer, I went on a camping trip to the Outer Banks and saw my first lighthouse. And I was hooked from there, wanting to photograph more and more lighthouses. So um, for the next four or five years, I pretty much self-taught myself photography and would go on road trips with my uncle. And I got my own car, go on myself. But it wasn't until... Uh, 2005 that I really got very serious about photography. I started working for a professional photographer, for a photography company, and they taught me very, the specifics of what I really needed to know to go professional. So the first few pictures I want to show you is just me the first few years of going around and taking pictures and some of my first nighttime photography of lighthouses. And then you'll see starting in 2005, there's going to be a big jump in the quality and technique of what I was doing. So um, just a couple of pictures of me from many, many years ago, um, just learning the ropes of photography and taking pictures of lighthouses. Um, this is one of the first things my, me and my uncle tried doing was we built this giant tripod. We were going to try to take pictures down on the Florida Keys in 2004. Um, but we weren't able to get permission from the Coast Guard to plant the thing near the near all the coral reefs so we kind of abandoned it but one of these days we may take it back out so um just the adventures of the last 25 years have just been a blast so um wanted to show you the first few pictures here the very first nighttime picture i ever took in 2000 was at barnegat lighthouse and it was just by chance we were, were running late so we missed sunset and just gave it a try and really enjoyed what the pictures I got when I developed them. So it made me want to go out and photograph lighthouses more specifically at nighttime. And quite frankly, that's what they do. They work at nighttime. So I kind of made it a uh, 
a mission to go out and photograph all these at nighttime. Um, so 2000, 2001, I was experimenting uh, using flashlights or even just the high beams of our car to kind of illuminate them. Um, And in 2003, I started shooting digital and started using a couple of websites to get the um, the moon calculations, when the moon would be up, the angle, and so forth, because just wanted to be able to have more um, landscape lighting from the moon. So you can see they're very grainy, um, just very dark, but I, I just wanted to show how it's going to develop once I really start getting into working as a professional. Uh, these are from 2003, just after Hatteras had moved a couple of years ago. And you'll see a lot of these pictures of these lighthouses from years later, how much the technique has changed. This is from 2003, 2004, 2004, Chatham, and the Highland Light, and at Hillsborough. And then Reedy Island. Again, a lot of these are going to come up years later in a much better photography scene. All right. So we'll just jump into all the good stuff here. This is uh, Point Benita. This was actually taken last year uh, with permission from the uh, U.S. Lighthouse. I'm sorry, the um, National Park Service, we work with them. They took us down in order to photograph this because it's normally closed off at nighttime. Point Cabrillo back in 2013. We got a few from Canada here. We did a trip here in, we did two trips, 2016 and 2017. Here's the East Quadi Light. La Matra light, uh, which what makes this very unique is we actually got in late. We were just resting, and then the northern lights started to come up. And it's amazing how fast a couple of photographers will immediately wake up when they uh, when they hear that's out there. So we we quickly jumped up and got a couple of really great pictures before it disappeared. This is the same lighthouse just a few hours later. Um, really, really thick fog came in. Um, but we, we love shooting in the fog because we love shooting the beams of light, especially from Fresnel lenses. This is the uh, Father Point Lighthouse all along the, uh, along the uh, St. Lawrence River. Same lighthouse. What, what's unique about this lighthouse is the Fresnel lens, they keep it on, but it does not spin. Um, so it's not an official aid to navigation. But for our per for our photography uh, purposes, it's perfect because it's not moving around. We can get very very distinct beams. So same lighthouse, just a few minutes apart. The fog got a little thicker. You can see the moon was coming through here, and then it got thicker, and then we lost it. But great beams of light. Woods Island. There's actually three little lights here, and these are there's just two of them. This is the Reedy Island Lighthouse down in Delaware. Uh, very, very thick fog. This is a range light, so the light does not move at all. And then went back on another night, and it is an extremely clear night. So you get a whole different perspective of what the area can look like. Very dark skies down there. Hillsboro in Florida. Cape Florida, I was able to work with the uh, museum, the society down there. They allowed me to come down and place a couple lights at sunset and light up the lighthouse. Cape San Blas, this is its new location. Um, the, I have not been to that lighthouse before, except for back in 20, uh, 2006, 2007, when it was behind a fence. It was not in a very good location. So it was nice that they have moved it to this new spot. It gives a lot of Great photo potential in the community. You can get to go see it as well. Pensacola Lighthouse. This is St. Mark's Lighthouse in 2007. Um, this is actually not sunset or sunrise. That is actually a lightning storm in the background that illuminated the sky. So, 
big Sabalai house. This is a, there's three lighthouses picture, uh, three lighthouses in this picture at the Duluth Harbor. You know the main tower, and then you have the pier lights. Hey P, can you go back to the Duluth Harbor one just before this and explain? Yeah, that one because that's the uh, Milky Way, isn't it? That is the Milky Way there. Um, how so, you, how can you possibly get the Milky Way and the lighthouse and the light on it at the same time? It's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so um, what we do is we. For, to get this picture, we had to work with the uh, the state park to go out to out in Lunnington because it's normally closed off at nighttime. Uh, so one of the workshops we did, we got the permit. We were allowed to go out. Uh, we timed our visit to be where the Milky Way would be uh, south southwest at a specific time, and we uh, put a, a one of my video lights up on a light stand and illuminated the lighthouse itself. Uh, put it at a very dim light setting to equal out with the ambient light and as the lighthouse blinks on and off uh we time the shutters of our camera to capture it when it goes um and then for the milky way itself we're shooting at a pretty high iso about 8000 iso um actually you can see the numbers right here 8000 iso f28 uh, tw uh, 20 second exposure to get this um, I generally don't want people shooting faster than 20 seconds because the stars will start to blur. Um, and then if you, you can go down about 15 seconds, but you got to really start cranking the ISO up. But it, um, you just need a really, really sturdy tripod and you need a little bit of light to help illuminate the tower so it stands out. So, and you're going to see a whole bunch more coming up, and I can explain some of the more technical uh, pictures as they come up. This is uh, Grand Haven, way back in uh, 2008. This is Grand Maris, same deal. I put up just a little bit of light off to the side here just to illuminate the, the tower. Normally, I don't shoot lighthouses, the, these little skeleton towers like this, but because there was talk about them removing the Fresnel lens that was in there, I, I had gone over there to grab a picture before it came out. Same lighthouse, just a little bit of a different angle. This is Little Sobble. Uh, same deal. We work with that state park. Uh, put up a artificial light to help illuminate it. Otherwise, the whole scene would just be completely black. Um, and we just timed our visit to go along with the Milky Way. Uh, you cannot really get this picture very easily anymore because the lake uh, level is so high. Uh, the year we went, uh, there was record low level. So we're actually able to walk out on the beach uh, on our last visit, the water was pretty much right up to the the edge here. So you'd have to go wading out in the water to go grab a picture like this. Same night, Milky Way just moved a little bit. We turned our angle with it. Let's just look in the other direction. Marblehead Lighthouse with the moon setting just before dawn. So in 2019, if you guys remember, uh, the polar vortex came down and pretty much half the country had record low temperatures. Um, most people stay in. I decided to get in my car because I had a couple of days off from work and drove out there. And um, uh, the coldest temperature I hit, uh, the wind chill was a negative 47 on one of the days. Um, but I, I wanted to get out and experience it and catch all the the ice barnacles and so forth and all the, the lighthouses. So this was a uh, Grand Haven lighthouse uh, just after sunset. That's just an incredible picture. Thank you. It, it, uh, it was a pretty tough hike out there on all the ice. It was, it was cold a lot of just slipping around and I mean, I'll be honest, it wasn't the safest thing to do, but I did it. <laughs> so, um, but I'm glad I did it and got the picture. It's one of my favorites of all time. Uh, same, same area, only looking from the other side of the harbor. Um, the black sky is actually a snow squall coming in. Um, because of the town lights, it illuminates the, the lighthouses so much. Uh, within five minutes, that sky actually turns blue again. It's just amazing how dark the uh, snow squalls will turn the, squ uh, turn the sky at nighttime. This is the, uh, 
Manistee North Light uh, the next day. Same storm, same trip, just the very next day. Now, this is at the uh, Prescott Isle Lighthouse. Um, just like all the other places we're going to be talking about, putting up a, uh, I think when we put up a, um, a video light to help illuminate the tower, and we always time our visit to go with the Milky Way or the moon, depending on what we're doing. But if we're doing Milky Way shots, we always time our visits to be where the Milky Way would be at an optimal uh, location for us to shoot. Now, this was, let me see here. So this is, if you look here, this is 10, uh, 10 o'clock at night. The next morning at 3.40, the moon is up. So you get a completely different look at the whole horizon and and, and sky and, and the lighthouse. So right here, it's it would be all black and shadow, except for the one video light that I'm illuminating everything with. But right here, you can see that we have a pretty bright moon up, illuminating the entire horizon. So when you do these photo uh, projects, when do you actually sleep? Uh, we take naps during the day. So it's... Uh, it's when I advertise these, I, I put in the literature that, you know, we're, we're out there to take pictures specifically at nighttime. And unless it's absolutely pouring, we're going to be out there photographing these things. And, and that's what people want to do uh, when they come on these. They want to photograph lighthouses at nighttime. They want to be able to get the special access and get the pictures you can't get normally on your own. Um with this specific lighthouse here, there is normally a light, uh, a, a security pole light that's off to the side that's normally illuminated, and it just blows out the entire scene. Um, we work with the museum, uh, made a donation to the museum, and they shut that light off for us for that for this specific night. And then we put up our own little video light to, it, it looks very dim to the naked eye, but when you photograph at nighttime and you shoot for 20 seconds, it... Uh, the light really equals out. It looks a lot brighter than what it really is. But with that security light on, it would have just blown this whole picture out. So, um, yeah, it, and we just got really lucky. It was a super clear night. And, you know, it's, there's no sleep on a lot of these nights. Same lighthouse. This is a uh, panorama picture. This is seven pictures the computer puts together um, to create the much wider shot. This was at a Split Rock Lighthouse one night on a uh, a snowy night and uh, got like a really incredible super beam coming out of it. This was for the uh, Edmund Fitzgerald um, anniversary lighting back in 2000. So this picture here, I put these two together. This is Tawas. Is no longer illuminated at nighttime, unfortunately. Um, this was a uh, composite of two different pictures. The, the picture on the right would have been a you know, 15 or 20 second exposure, whereas on the left, it's probably about a 20 minute exposure. So you can see looking due north, you can see where the north star is going to be. And then shooting at 20 minutes, the spiral of the earth and the rotation of it. This is Whitefish Point. Um, we did an all-night photography workshop there as well, where it started off uh, without the moon up. And then, I'm sorry, with the moon up, and then as the moon goes down, we would get our Milky Way shots. And we actually got a shooting star coming through on this one. Meteor came preaching through. Now, in tw uh, 2022, uh, I ran a photography workshop of main lighthouses and harbors if you guys remember um in that september uh the whole northeast of the country was covered in smoke coming from the wildfires in canada so a lot of our uh sunrises and sunsets or in this case moonrises and moonsets uh they were very very orange brownish in color because of all the smoke and haze in the air um we timed this photography workshop to be out with the the full moon instead of what Milky Way pictures. And uh, we got pretty lucky having clear skies for this. Uh, but 
when I say clear, at least without clouds, but the haze from the smoke really created very, very uh, brownish red colors in the moon and on the in the in the, in the sunrises we were getting. Same trip. That's a moonrise again. Really, really smoky skies, creating different colors. It's so, uh, Rockland. Uh, we had lined up for the uh, moonrise on the beach for whale back as well on the same trip. On one of our photography workshops at nighttime, we did a boat ride over to Burnt Island. Uh, again, getting permission from the owners. And um, there were six of us. We took the boat over and landed, did our nighttime pictures and, and got out of there. But we... Um, we put up our light and got our pictures within about 20 minutes. We were only authorized to be there for about an hour or so. So we, we made the best of it. Hey, Pete, can you go back one real quick? Yeah. So I noticed the lighthouse in this is a little bit uh, out of focus. So the moon's really in focus. Do you have mm -hmm. issues with depth of field dealing with that when you're doing uh, time exposures like this? How do you control depth of field? Oh. Well, the lighthouse is pretty sharp. Well, oh, you're seeing yeah, it's sharp. But you know, you go closer, it's sharper. Yeah. Yeah, it's um the the boat is in motion just because it was a is a you can see right here it's a tenth of a second at f seven one, um, it, when you're really working with these really long uh, uh lenses like I, right here I'm shooting at four hundred and sixty millimeters, you do have to really watch out for your depth of field. You have to shoot at a higher aperture because at f two eight or f four, even though it's so far away you would think it'd all be at infinity it it really is not when you're when you're talking really really long lenses that's why like with sports or wildlife the the person or the animal that you're photographing is always sharp in the background so out of focus um and this is probably why i didn't shoot it like f4 or 5.6 because i i need a little bit more depth of field but the consequence of that is you have to shoot slower and you get a slightly blur on your boat so um and there's gonna be some other zoom shots you're gonna see coming up where um I can look at the exposure numbers, you can see that but how we worked that out. And Cape Netic. A couple different trips. This was uh in 2015, right after a blizzard. This is a doubling point. So for lightning shots, when you know the storm is out there, you don't you don't know when the lightning is going to flash. So what we would do is set up our cameras, set up the tripods, and we would just lock in our cable release and just let the camera continually shoot pictures. Um, so this was shooting 30 seconds F5 at 400 ISO, and we would just let them run. And you just have to wait for a, light, a flash of lightning to strike. You could shoot 200 pictures. You may not get anything, but you know, in that on that very last picture, when you get the the flash, you know, you got it. But that's only something you'd be able to do with digital photography. I mean, you really could do that with film, right? Yeah, well, you could, but you have to change the roll of film out every 24 pictures. Um, if you knew what your exposure is, you can do the same thing. You just gotta lock it in and let it just continually shoot. But you just maybe burning rolls of film away. For no reason. If you have a whole roll that you didn't catch a lightning bolt, you just toss it away. Um, that is a benefit of digital is that it makes you could do thousand pictures and it costs the same as doing one picture. Oh, absolutely. And it's 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 a blessing, but then it's not because it kind of makes some with different situations, it may make you lazy or not think as hard, like, oh, I'll just reshoot it if I make a mistake. Um, and it kind of goes back to my first four years of photography where I shot film. It really taught me to think and plan ahead and and put some time into taking a picture because you know a 16 17 year old kid can't be blown film away um you got to really plan what you're shooting and take your time so um i mean nowadays i may shoot more than i should but it'll i always think about like i shouldn't just blow all these pictures because it, you don't think it's it's art it's not you, you need to put a little thought into it this is Fort Point. This is Halfway Rock. We uh, 
we got permission from the owner to go out for this one. And um, it, it rained pretty heavily the night before. And by the time we got out to, we had to ride the boat out and then get on the little raft to get out there. The raft was flooded. So it took us about 20 or so minutes to to use buckets and such to get it done. So we we missed the actual nighttime pictures, but we got out there in time for dawn to get some pictures. Hey, uh, Pete, we have a request from somebody. If you could, when you uh, say the name of a lighthouse, could you mention the state that it's in also? Yeah, no problem. Okay. All right, so these are all in Maine right now. This is Marshall Point, the world famous Marshall Point from Forrest Gump. This is the same night. Uh, the fog was just uh, rolling in and out, so we were able to catch the moon for a few minutes. And this is on a uh, full moon trip. There's so many different angles at Marshall Point. It's it's a really great photo location if no one's ever been there before. You definitely got to check it out. This is uh, right after a blizzard. Um, I was running a photography workshop, but a couple of days prior, I was uh, photographing gymnastics for a company. And the owner's wife gave me this giant uh, Olaf doll to give to my kids. Uh, it, it, was, it sits about three feet tall. I didn't know what to do with it, but I had to take it with me. And while on the trip, everyone had seen it. And I'm like, oh, let's put it to use. So we put it out there for a couple of pictures. Alice Head Lighthouse. Bemiku Lighthouse, so you guys probably saw on the news that the, uh, the Bell Tower building here is taking some major damage. So we're hoping that uh, they'll be able to get that repaired this summer. Pete, I just want to mention that these lighthouses, the last few you've shown, and this one are in Maine. This is Pemulcan Point yeah. again, but just yeah. so people know what state we're in at this point. Yeah, these are all in Maine. When we, when we change states, I'll let you know. I, I have all these in state order. So mm -hmm. um, so this is the same deal with the lightning. Uh, there was yeah, about four or five photographers there. And same deal, we just would lock in our cable releases and just let it run for the next hour or two and um, just take pictures. Uh, I, I always communicate with the township and when we're going to be out there for the night, which they always appreciate. Um, they've had kids out there doing dumb things in the past. So they appreciate when we're out there keeping an eye on it. And, uh, we've even had police officers come on up and say, Hey, you know, just, if you see anything, just let us know. So unfortunately some kids will cause some problems out there, but you know, luckily not too much. Same lighthouse, Pemaquib, on a very, very foggy night. And then on a very clear night, looking north. This is Ram Island in Maine. Um, the recent storm, as well, the same storm that damaged uh, Pemaquid, unfortunately took out the whole walkway here. You know, hopefully the owner is going to be able to restore that and put it back in. Um this picture was also taken one of the workshops. We chartered a boat out there with permission of the owner and got our nighttime pictures. Saddleback ledge on a um, full moon night, a full moon rise. Again, still in Maine. Yeah, excuse me for a second. I just want to mention people are asking questions in the chat, just so people know. We'll okay. get to the questions at the end of your presentation. So I just want people to be aware of that. Thanks. Okay, I, I can't see the chats that are popping up or the questions. So, um, this is a uh, Seguin Island in Maine as well. Uh, we, um, you're allowed to rent out the keeper's house for the night. So, our photography workshop did that and got extremely lucky, uh, not just with the weather, but when we go to the lighthouse keeper pictures, I'll explain. Uh, we did some really, really nice lighthouse keeper pictures here as well. West Quaddy Head. Same, uh, same lighthouse, a little bit different night. This is in Maryland, Chop Tank Lighthouse. The one really incredible sunset we had. Cove Point in Maryland. Uh, normally there is a um, security light on a pole that's just off to the left. And you know, we work with the society and the museum. And uh, we had that turned off for our photography workshop. 
Otherwise, this would have just been completely blown out with a greenish sodium vapor light. Hey, Pete, with, uh, so like in this image right here, oh, that's fine. Um, it's like a real big white blob. You don't see a lot of the beams. And in some of your pictures, you really get a lot of definition of the Fresnel lens. So is there a way you can, like in this shot, would there have been a way to, to get the detail of the lens and the light at the same time? So it, there's a couple different scenarios involved. Um, one, it depends on how fast the lens is spinning. Two, how big the lens is. And three, you could always, you know, there's a way to do it. You could take multiple pictures and layer it. Um, and you'll see that in a couple other pictures. I can point that out. Um, sometimes they're just, especially some of these big, bigger Fresnel lenses, they're just so bright without really having a Photoshop within the lantern room, there's only so much you can do, especially at a nighttime picture. At dawn and dusk, when the ambient light is a lot brighter, you can see the, you can shoot faster and darker in order to have the detail of the lens come in. But there are just some instances where, especially if the lens is spinning, if you want to capture the distinct beam in here, you have to shoot fast. And unfortunately, you're going to have to blow this out to capture that. Same lighthouse, just different angle. Thomas Point from a charter boat that we went out on. Drum Point Lighthouse. This is all in Maryland. Now, this is from an overlook in Boston Harbor. This is the Boston Harbor Lighthouse, and this is the Graves Lighthouse. Um, and within the last six months or so, they have installed a Fresnel lens in the Graves Lighthouse. So I'm hoping to go out there sometime soon and photograph that. But there's a uh, little fort right there overlooking both of these. So anyone can go up there and get this picture anywhere from dawn to dusk. Uh, this is in Boston, Massachusetts. Yeah. For those fort, don't know. fort Revere, I was going to say, it's actually in the town of Hull where you got this picture. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a great, great viewpoint. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. It, it, as soon as it starts getting dark, the uh, local police are going to chase you out unless you have a permit to be up there. And Jeremy, wasn't Hull the location of the actual first lighthouse in the United States? Uh, yes, Boston Light was the first lighthouse in the United States. In Hull, it was originally in Hull. Um, well, it's in Hull now. I mean, officially, it's within the town, borders of the town of Hull. Um let me just mention, somebody just asked that it's interesting that you and I, Jeff, can ask questions, but no one else can. It's just we can't let everybody open their mics during a peace presentation, but everybody will have a chance to ask questions at the end. Right. And if you want to uh, not forget your question, type it into the chat and we'll get the answer to it at the end. All right. A uh, great point in, uh, what was that, Massachusetts? On Nantucket. Yeah, yeah, Nantucket. Well, long exposure for this one, but so uh, one thing to notice in this picture: see how it's completely dark. This is a moonless light, a moonless night. Um, a lot of the other pictures where you notice if I put up the video light in order to illuminate it, this is a big reason why. Um, if you don't want it to be fully silhouetted, you put the light up. But naturally, this is how dark it is in a lot of these locations. So. Um, if you want to see any detail, you have to put a light up to see what you're doing. Uh, this is in uh, Newport Harbor, Good Island. Point Judith, Rhode Island. And we had permission from the Coast Guard to be out there for these pictures. This is at Thatcher Island. This is, uh, I'm standing on the North Tower looking at the South Tower for this picture. Cape May Lighthouse. Now here's East Point Lighthouse. You remember one of my, the first pictures I posted from the early 2000s compared to you know this picture now. It's a major leap in technique and such. And as well as planning the angle of the moon in order to get that fully illuminated. This was in 2022. We actually chartered a whale watching boat to go out and we mounted a whole bunch of lights on the side of the ship in order to illuminate several of these lighthouses at nighttime. Fortunately, we after this first lighthouse, a major storm came in and we had to scrap the rest of the night. But 
you know, I'm, I'm happy we're able to get what we did. This uh, the moonrise at Ship John. Fire Island, New York. Jeffrey's Hook, New York, under the um, I'm sorry, the um, George Washington Bridge. Montauk Point. We're actually going there for a photo workshop next week. Um, and working with the museum, we're actually going to have all of these lights turned off so it doesn't blow out the whole horizon. And we'll work with the state park and the uh, local township to be able to get access around the entire ground. So that should be a uh, should and be really they, they, they just relit their original Fresnel lens. Yeah, and that that was the main reason why we contacted them. Um, I was trying to work a workshop with them a couple years ago, but they were just starting the restoration, and then with COVID going on, um, but it was a big surprise to hear that they were putting the lens in. So the moment they announced all that, we immediately contacted them, and they've been really great to work with. So, um, I'll be sending uh, Jeff and Jeremy some pictures from that, and hopefully he'll be able to share that with the society in the next few weeks. Cape Blanco Lighthouse. This is one of those instances where you have a really, really large Fresnel lens. I think it's a second order lens, second or third, uh, but it spins really fast and it's it just it will blow out your picture. Now, um, photographing this lighthouse, we normally try to come out when the moon is up in order to illuminate the landscape because it's trying to do it in the dead of night. You'll see the next picture. Um, you really can't see anything if you try to expose for just the light itself. It's these these larger Fresnel lenses are just really bright. In Cape Blanco is in Oregon. Yeah, they, I'm sorry. Yeah, these Montauk these are, in New York, Long Island to Oregon. <laughs> yeah, so it's, essentially we're going in alphabetical order here. So, uh, so yeah, these are in Oregon. This is a Cedar Head Lighthouse. Um, this is a first order lens, I believe. And uh, looking straight into it, we I was able to do a second exposure, just trying to tone this down just a little bit. Also, photograph, take the picture when the lens is not blasting straight into you, essentially when the beams are around to the sides. Same lighthouse, just very far, you can see. So I'm standing, ooh, I believe right out here. If you can see, you can see my mouse cursor, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna stand right out yes. there yep. for this picture here. There's like a lookout on the side of the road there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So this is one of those, if you try photographing this at nighttime without the moon up, it's just going to be a big, giant orb of light without being able to see anything else. Um, Uncle River Lighthouse, uh, one of my favorite ones. It's got a, fir a first order Fresnel lens, but it has 24 panels, uh, white, white, red, white, white, red. You'll see an interior picture with a lighthouse keeper shortly. Um, my very first visit here, uh, it was on a very clear night, no fog whatsoever, and I mean, it was nice to see it at nighttime, but it wasn't nearly as impressive. Um, the next time we visited, a really, really thick fog came in, and it makes all the difference in the world. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily. I like photographing lighthouses at nighttime with the Milky Way, but I don't mind having the moon up. I don't mind going out on really foggy nights. It's to me to, to really bring out the beams of light. You you need some moisture in the sky. And if you have to sacrifice the Milky Way to get beams of light like this, and I'll I'll take that any time. Yeah. Unqua River. I'm sorry, this is a we're still in Oregon, Yaquina Head Lighthouse. Uh, this is one of those places that you definitely have to have the permit and permission to be out there. And uh, since it's out in a little peninsula, it's very susceptible to fog. Very foggy night with the moon setting. You know, with a Fresnel lens that blinks. So you can try to to work the exposure as best as you can. And then here on a separate trip where it wasn't nearly as foggy, but the moon is up on a different angle. And you can light up the entire horizon. Now we're going to the North Carolina and the Outer Banks. This is Body Island with the Milky Way. If you remember my first couple of years of lighthouse photography, you'd come out here and photograph it with the moon up. And then I uh, wanted to try some different lighting. So we were doing Milky Way shots. Oak Island Lighthouse. Many, many different angles of uh, Cape. This is Cape Lookout Lighthouse. There's going to be many different angles. This is the moon up when they had the aero beacons. They had spinning 
arrow begins in the lighthouse. In the last few years, they converted it to a blinking LED, which um, pros and cons. The cons of it, you don't have the spinning giant beams of light coming out. But what it does is it allows you to be able to take Milky Way pictures a lot better because you don't have this giant spinning light blowing out all your pictures. So this is a moonrise with the old arrow beacons with the spinning light. Uh, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead here for a second here. So to go from that spinning light to a much dimmer blinking light allows you to be able to capture the Milky Way, whereas before it would have just blown out your picture or giant beams would have been covering your uh, your Milky Way here. So I'm going to go back a few here to Cape Hatteras. As you guys probably know, they are restoring the tower and they're going to put a Fresnel lens at the top. Uh, all of these following pictures um, have the spinning arrow beacon in. And um, I'm really looking forward to being able to go out there and photograph it with a Fresnel lens with a completely different uh, signal and uh, look to it at night. Cape Hatteras at nighttime with the Milky Way. And then my friend Dave and Jenny posing as lighthouse keeper and wife. You'll get, you'll see a lot more of the lighthouse keeper pictures coming up. This is Body Island, and all in uh, Outer Banks. So, uh, Cape Lookout from a different angle. This is still Lake Cape Lookout in North Carolina. I included this picture. It's not truly nighttime. It's not daytime either. This is one of those pictures where with lightning storm in the distance, we just locked in our cameras and just got lucky. You had one good lightning bolt and that was the shot. So you just got to get lucky and just have the camera running right place, right time. This is a different trip. Same thing with Cape Hatteras. Just let the cameras run and hopefully get a lightning shot. Cape Lookout again. We're going to go to Washington now. Uh, this is the Cape Disappointment Lighthouse. New Dungeness Lighthouse. Chad Kaiser, a friend of mine, uh, stays out there and is the uh, museum director. And he uh, really takes really good care of the place. If anyone can ever get out there to visit, I highly suggest trying to get out there. North Head Lighthouse on a very foggy night. Um, this is the arrow beacon in here. They have since switched this to an LED light, so it looks very different now. This is the Point Wilson light. So now I'm going to jump here to one of the things we do on our photography workshops is we go to lighthouses that uh, either the lens has been taken out completely or the Fresnel lens has been deactivated. And we work with uh, the museums, the societies, and with the U.S. Coast Guard to get permission to have the lenses illuminated. Or we actually, in this case, we put our own lenses up there in order to make the lighthouse look like it's active. So our first time we did this was in 2014 at Point Reyes Lighthouse. Uh, the first order of Fresnel lens is still in the tower, um, but they Coast Guard put up a little modern tower outside of the whole structure. Um, but for our photography workshop, the Coast Guard actually came out, shut off the modern light, and the uh, U.S. Park Service uh, Ranger put on the lens for us. This is uh, one of the Coast Guard guys down here posing for us. We almost didn't be, we were almost were not able to do this night because it was so foggy. They almost didn't want us walking down the steps, but luckily we were able to pull this off. We did it again last year, and those pictures are going to be coming up right here. Complete do you have an image of uh, of what it looked like when you had your own Fresnel lens you created with the? Yeah, that's that that's coming up. Uh, you'll oh, see. Okay. That. Yeah, it. I just wanted to show like a picture of a behind the scenes picture before we we got into it. Um. So this is the same lighthouse, completely different trip. This is 2013, 2023. Um, 
the the park rangers completely removed all the well they they put all the curtains in the back so we could fully see the lens and it it was a really really great night of photography to be able to the one go down there at nighttime is extremely rare and then have the lens turned on that's that's very very rare so you can see back in here the modern light is still on Now, this is one of those instances where um, I did a second exposure to try to bring in a little bit of detail, but I didn't want to make it too dark because you'd start to, it, it just wouldn't look natural to see too much darkness in there. It has to just be really bright. So, the first picture you saw in this series was where we were installing a, our, our custom Fresnel lens setup. Uh, this was at Point Arena last year. Um, with again permission of the museum and with the Coast Guard allowing us to do this, we installed these Fresnel lenses and we were able to. This is a lighthouse, I forget what year, but it has not been active since I believe the 90s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so none of us have ever seen pictures of this at all. So we, we were able to create our own, you know, first time in 30 years. So the first order of Fresnel lens was decommissioned in 1977, mm -hmm. and it was replaced with a rotating arrow beacon, and the current light is a VLB44 LED. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's uh, Mark Hancock speaking, who's the yep. director of Point Arena Lighthouse. Yeah, Mark, how are you? Good, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, well, got to thank Mark for allowing this. us to do this out there. Oh, I'm glad you got some good shots. I hadn't. Hadn't seen a lot of these, so this is cool. No, I'll have to send you some more. I, I thought I sent you. If you, I'll send them to you uh, tonight or tomorrow, then. So, but we we had a really really great night out there and had a lot of fun. This is a Point Cabrillo. Um, at this particular time, um, I included in here because the uh, the motor and the lens was down, so they had a modern light going. Um, but we had uh, talked with the U.S. Coast Guard. They gave us permission for about 20 minutes to have the light turned on for our photography workshop. So uh, the museum turned it on for us. Now, this is in Canada, in Quebec. Uh, we were given permission to put a light bulb in the Fresnel lens here at uh, uh, Chop, uh, Cap Chat Lighthouse along the St. Lawrence. Again, it's along the uh, St. Lawrence. I'm going to butcher this name. Pointe de uh, Rem Remini. I can't speak French at all. Uh, it translates to Fame Point. Um, same deal. We were, we got permission and we put a, a light bulb in the lens in order to take our pictures. Uh, now in Oregon, Kate Mears Lighthouse. Um, if you guys remember in the news years ago, a couple of vandals showed up and shot a whole bunch of gunshot holes into the Fresnel lens there, and it's not been active. Um, but with working with the uh, the park and the Coast Guard, we were allowed to put the light bulb in there and, and take some, some pictures for hopefully they can use towards a restoration of the lens one day. Now, Jeff Gales had a help in this one um, at his lighthouse. Um, we were, uh, we, we organized to stay out there for the night, but he surprised us and had the coast guard come out, shut off the modern light and, uh, turn on the Fresnel lens for us. So that was a big surprise and a great treat for us to be able to have that opportunity. This is down in a uh, Roanoke river, North Carolina. Um, this lighthouse has moved several times in its life. This is its current location. Um, but, uh, they normally don't have a light at the top of it, at least back in 2015, they did not, but they allowed us to put a light bulb up there and get a couple of pictures. In the, uh, last category here, um, lighthouse keepers, um, this really started in, when I was in college, um, I was working, I had to come up with a documentary or a film to work on. And since I really like lighthouses, I had to be very specific. And my instructor said, why don't you do it on lighthouse keepers? So 
I actually went out and interviewed 20 different lighthouse keepers from across the country, many different lighthouses. And it occurred to me that I didn't have any B-roll or any pictures to show them as these guys were talking. So I started uh, posing myself for some pictures. And then I uh, was able to find out where I could get a lighthouse keeper uniform. So I had a uh, uh, lighthouseantiques.net make it up for me. And uh, a lot of the pictures you're going to see here are going to be of that uniform. So this is me dressed up as a Coast Guard Coast Guard guy at Thatcher Island uh, because a couple of different keepers I interviewed actually stayed there in the uh, 60s and 70s. So I'm going to start going through here. This is uh, Hillsboro down in uh, Florida. Uh, it's a second order clamshell lens. I just one of my favorite pictures. I did it with a drone, and it really shows the scale of a second order for a clamshell lens. This is inside with the lens. Uh, this is Marshall Point in Maine. That's actually me posing for the picture. That's me again. It's back in 2015. I got the uniform in uh, 2015, and we we did a lot of pictures with it right off the bat. It's too bad you couldn't get Tom Hanks to do it. Yeah, we would have been. We would have had a huge beard for it, wouldn't he? Be a little a little dirty though. He was doing his run. All right, so this is at Currituck Beach, North Carolina. They have a really, really nice interior with a staircase that works really well for this. At Owl's Head Lighthouse, um, we worked with Bob Trapani, and we did a fundraiser. I think we raised like $500 for the museum one night. Um, we came on out and... Uh, did some pictures with a lighthouse keeper and gave us access to the grounds at nighttime. And we got some really, really nice pictures. It's one of my favorites at night. Hey Pete, when, yeah. when we do our full moon night tours at Point Arena, yeah. um, I've, I've got a um, an old engineer's oil lamp that they used to that crane people used to use but apparently so did lighthouse keepers and okay. it's, not, it's not like the one that you've got where it's enclosed it's actually an open open flame oh, and wow. it really makes for amazing patterns inside the tower when we're climbing it very cool you have to show me a couple of pictures if you can next time you're out there yeah i'll shoot some with it next time i do a full moon tour in june very cool. Yeah, you have to let me know. So when we were showing pictures of Seguin Island, we were out there for the night, and I had all intentions to wear the lighthouse keeper uniform. But uh, along came this uh, this uh, husband and wife, and they were just sitting out there, and it was this gentleman. And we're all looking at each other like, that guy would look way better in the uniform than I would. But everyone was kind of afraid to ask him. So I wound up going up to him, and he was more than happy to do it. So for the next two hours... He uh he wore the uniform for us and just posed around the lighthouse in various spots. And believe it or not, him and his wife, they sold their house and they just sail around the world. So this guy just happened to be on this remote island in Maine the same time we were and more than willing to pose for a bunch of crazy people with cameras. You guys have probably seen this picture. It's been on U.S. Lighthouse Digest. It's been on the Coast Guard magazine. It's been around. Unfortunately, um, if Bob Trapani or someone can chime in, I don't know if the Fresnel lens has been, I guess the wire, the power cord out there went down. They've been using the modern optic and not the Fresnel lens. I don't know. Have they restored that yet? Does anybody know? I don't think so. Bob's not here. I talked to him just a couple hours ago. He wasn't able to make it for this, okay. but um, I don't believe they fully restored the power out there, but um, I'm going to, I'm going to check on that and I'll get back to you on that. No problem. It's inside uh, Seguin Island. I couldn't have that guy stay around all night. He had to leave at some point. So um, I wound up putting the uniform on and posing for a picture at nighttime. This is at uh, Little River. Um, and uh, Terry Roden is the uh, keeper out there during the season. And uh, we went out there. We... We uh, paid to spend the night at the keeper's uh, house, and he put on a great show for us with the keeper uniform. 
wasn't around and letting us get some pictures of him. He was a really just, good guy. I just want to mention Terry is the summer caretaker or keeper out there now, but he was, as a young man, he was in the Coast Guard. And he was a Coast Guard light keeper there many years ago. So he's kind of had two lives there. Very cool. A very nice guy. If you can ever get out to Little River, I highly recommend a stay. This is uh, Chad Kaiser at the new Dungeness Lighthouse. This is the Unqua River Lighthouse uh, lens, the one that had the 24 panels, white, white, red. This is what it looks like on the inside. So, uh, yeah, I think it's the most beautiful Fresnel lens that's ever been made. Um, if anyone can ever get out there and do the tour, I highly suggest going in there. Again, this is in Oregon. This is Gray Har uh, Gray's Harbor in Washington with a drone shot. Uh, the Fresnel lens is deactivated, um, but uh, for this shot, they turned it on, had the gentleman wear the lighthouse keep uniform, and he's not touching the lens. Uh, we, he was very specific. I can put my hand up like I'm going to do it, but, you know, because of the rules and you don't want to damage the lens. He was pretending to touch it, but he did not actually touch the lens with any rags. This is at Piney Point in Maryland. That's uh, me posing for a picture. Give her another picture as well. This was a, I included this picture because technically Coast Guard, you know, was working the lights for us. So this is a, a Point Reyes in California with the Coast Guard when they let the lens back, uh, lens for us back then. And then this was last year, me posing with the uh, the tower in the keeper uniform. This is my friend Dave at Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And Sim and his wife during one of our photo workshops. So on this particular night, it was... Uh, trying to fake this picture with a real match was just not possible with all the wind going so if you look really careful i'm going to give away one of my little secrets here in order to get this picture we actually have a match but we have a little battery powered light bulb in a mechanism right where the match would begin so it's actually just a light bulb pretending to be a flame just wanted to throw that in there There's little fun tricks that we do sometimes This is me and Dave posing at a body island lighthouse back in 2020. We just did some pictures of uh, Dave dressed up as the lighthouse keeper. And then um, we have uh, various uh, oil lamp, uh, uh, oil uh, cups and jars and such that we are using for pictures. This is all at Body Island, North Carolina. This is at East Point Lighthouse. Uh, we're looking at doing a photography workshop there. Um, so me and my girlfriend went down there to do some test pictures and just wanted to include a couple of these. Just trying to see more everyday life at a lighthouse. And then we took this a couple weeks ago at uh, Montauk Point. We're going to be down there next week, as I mentioned. So, and then uh, we got a minute or two. I just want to show a couple behind the scenes pictures. I keep talking about the workshops whenever we charter these boats out. Um, we charter big boats, little boats, and that's how we get a lot of our pictures from out in the water and at nighttime in a lot of these places. This was one of those really, uh, this is Boone Island on one of the really smoky sunrises. You saw the moonset pictures. This was the same boat, same trip. We just shot the moon set and then circled around for moonrise. This is photographing Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, out in the Florida Keys. I believe that's American Shoal. That was us that same night at Seguin Island in Maine. This was the uh, fundraiser at uh, Owl's Head Lighthouse a number of years ago. And down in the Outer Banks of uh, Cape Lookout, 
the only real way to photograph the lighthouse at nighttime, you got to spend the night. So we, we just camp out for the night down there. This is up in Michigan. And this was at um, uh, Point Arena uh, during our photography workshop up there. And behind the scenes at Point Reyes. that one, Pete, that was with the um, the temporary Fresnels that you fabricated. That, that is correct. Yeah, normally you would not get this type of shot. So um, uh, there is an exterior light, I believe, that was shut off as well to help tone a lot of the lighting down. And then we put up this one little light here to help just illuminate just bright enough so we could see it. And then uh, we ran... I don't know how many times I ran up this tower. I had to have been at least seven or eight times different different parts of the night. But in order to um to get the beams exactly where we would want them, we were able to just turn the whole mechanism to get that shot. And just point rays. Just more boat pictures. And then uh that's it for the lighthouse part of it. So um if uh Jeremy, if you have any if you have any, uh, if you want to start the Q and A, sure. Uh, let me just say first of all, Seguin Lighthouse. After the they lost their power cable, they did relight it pretty soon after that with a generator out there. It was announced that solar power was going to be installed, but I haven't heard anything lately about that, so I'm not sure where that stands. If anybody knows, tell us. Okay. But uh, I know they were able to relight it with a generator. Well, that's good um, news here. Yeah. So uh, before we take Q&A from, well, maybe we should start with Q&A from the audience and maybe then get back, Pete, to some of your other photography besides. Yeah, that, that's fine. Uh, besides the lighthouses. So I want to give everybody an opportunity to ask away. Yeah. So for the moment, if you want to come out of screen sharing. Sure. Um, we'll take some questions from the chat first and then give people the opportunity to ask questions verbally. Just give me a moment here to organize my. My windows, okay. There you go. A lot of stuff open. All right, so we did get a, a number of questions. And by the way, Pete, you know, you know, I think your photography is absolutely amazing, and we got some some comments uh, on that uh, along that line. So it's absolutely incredible. So uh, let's see. Carol asks, "Can oh, can you say the state? We did that, okay." Uh, Phyllis, notice the no contrails or flying aircraft flights. How do you plan for those type of events? Uh, for airplanes, I mean, it, if they do pop up, it. what we try to do is I photograph a bunch of pictures. If I can use one without one, then that's great. If there is one and that's the keeper picture, I'm just going to have to Photoshop it out. Um, mm -hmm. it, depending on where we are in the country, if it's one of the the highways that they use, essentially, lack of better words, where they're just constantly flying through, mm -hmm. you're going to have to Photoshop them out. There's not much you can really do about it. Um so in the middle of the night, it's it's not as bad. But if you're, you know, winter time when it's like 7 p.m., you're going to see a lot more airplanes. But essentially, if they're there, we just Photoshop them out. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary Martin, who's an excellent photographer in his own right, uh, says you need to buy some crampons if you're going to venture out in the frozen Lake Michigan piers. I, I had them. I had them on there, but it was still... It was cold and windy. Um, it, it, those are the the strap on spikes you put on the boots, right? Is that what, that's what those are, right? I yeah, believe so. Bangs. What, what is, was that? Is that Gary? That's me. They're called yeah. foot fangs, Pete. Okay, yeah. If foot fangs, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. If it's the thing you wrap around your boot with the spikes, I, I did have those, and those made they did make a huge difference. But it was still just, it's still slippery out there, regardless. It's when it's negative thirty, you're a little little numb so but if i didn't have those on i would not have been able to get out there in the first place so it was a smart decision to get those the day before the trip talk so. about dedication what's that uh talk about dedication i said uh, you know you wouldn't get me out there I, yeah you showed the nubble at uh, christmas time with the lights on it i live a half hour from there and i try to get out there every year but if it's you know if it's like below 20 you probably won't find mm -hmm. me out there 20 above it, that is it um, surprisingly it, there is a difference in what the the look of everything is when you get below zero you start getting like that real arctic the 
the really different shades of blue. You'll get that sea mist coming up. And it's, mm-hmm. it, it's, I know it's really cold, it's really tough, but it's to really capture that, you, you got to just, just do it just once, just to say you yeah. did it. Well, I have gotten up before sunrise to get a uh, whale back with sea smoke on mm-hmm. very cold mornings. So a couple gotcha. of times I've done that. Uh, Melissa asks, where do you get information on the Milky Way and when it will be uh, visible? Um, there's multiple different apps out there. Um, there's also websites, uh, a couple of apps you can use, uh, photographers, photographers ephemeris. Ephemeris. uh, there's a one I use called planets that allows me to see, uh, where the Milky way will be in a certain angle and what the height of it will be. You could also use photo pills. Um, there's also websites, the NASA, uh, weather channel, they, they'll, they give you a lot of that information as well. Um, Back in the early 2000s, before smartphones actually were a thing, you had to just simply look at charts and numbers and know your angles and what that all was. But cell phones now, you can literally do everything on your phone now. If you know, if you can get those apps on your phone, you can you can plan your whole trip as long as you know if you're standing looking due west or looking whatever your direction you're going to look at your lighthouse. You can then plan accordingly where the moon's going to rise, where the Milky Way will be, the height, angle, and so forth. So mm-hmm. there's it's so much information out there. It's 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 really good. Yeah, I know. I've used the photographer's ephemeris to find out where you know where the moon and sun are going to be to line up shots and things like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. You know, planets but, will do the same thing with the Milky Way. It just it just tells you the angles of it. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Gary again asks, Have you ever used a lightning trigger? I have not. Um, I know a few people have used them. Um, I don't own one. It's one of the things I should probably get, but I just don't don't have one right now. So mm-hmm. whenever we're doing the lightning stuff, I just lock the cable release in and it just fires away. Yeah. Well, it's, it's worth those lightning photos are incredible. Yeah. Uh, Alma asked, did, Pete, did you see the eclipse? Were you at a lighthouse for the event? <laughs> Uh, I was hoping to go out for the eclipse. Uh, unfortunately my, um, son's been having some medical issues, so I had to take him to the doctor that day. So, um, I watched it from my front lawn right here outside Philadelphia. We were about 80 to 90%. So it was, it got pretty dark. We saw the very nice crescent moon, but I would have had to have driven about uh, at least six hours to get in the totality but with my my son having a medical thing right now, I was not able to leave the house. Yeah. So, and you told me earlier he's doing better, right? He's doing much better. Thank you. It's 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 been a crazy week, but he's he's doing better now. That's so. great. Yeah. So we had ninety five percent totality here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It was it was really good. But I, cool. people who drove to Northern New Hampshire got stuck in pretty a pretty massive traffic jam later that yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, a couple of friends of mine, they they changed their plans. They were supposed to go out to Ohio, and then the very last minute, they changed plans, went up to Maine and Canada, and apparently it was very clear up there. So, mm-hmm. um, The other comments in the chat are pretty much fabulous photos, awesome photos. These photos are fascinating and things like that. I don't think we have any other questions in there, so, but I want to give people the opportunity to ask any If you still have any questions, you can put them in the chat. Or if anybody would like to ask a question or make a comment verbally, what you Mm -hmm. want to do is go down where it says, um, oh, I have to find it. They, Zoom keeps moving things around in there uh, where they put things. Uh, In the Zoom controls, the bottom, you see reactions. Click Mm -hmm. on the little arrow where it says reactions and you can choose raise hand i because i'm the host i see it differently but uh pete confirm to me that when you go to reactions and hit push on the arrow does it say say raise hand is an option there uh all right so i i'm on i'm on the zoom zoom controls on the bottom not in the chat but down on the bottom of the zoom controls towards oh reactions okay you reactions for me i'm doing it raise hand okay yeah i got i'm raising a hand Yep, I see it. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I see Mark's as well. Did you have a, another question or comment, Mark? No, I was just trying to help. Just out. demonstrating. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Because again, on the the uh, 
the, again, Zoom, you know, they can't leave well enough alone. Things get moved around in the controls. I swear that used to be in the middle and I couldn't find it. But um, anyway, I wasn't sure. I see something different when I look at the controls. So thank you for confirming that. Uh, uh, Bonnie, you have a question. You have your hand raised. Bonnie Dowler, do you have a question? If so, you can un unmute. Un unmute, unmute your microphone. Um, ask to unmute. Okay. You want to click the uh, microphone icon on the lower left to unmute yourself. There you go. Did you have a question, Bonnie? Maybe not. Or maybe your mic isn't working. We're not hearing anything. So, sorry. Well, we'll try to, we'll come back to you if uh, we can figure that out. Oop. I think Bonnie put her hand down. Uh, anybody else uh, like to uh, say anything verbally, question or comment or, um, oh, okay. Uh, two people have added uh, interesting things in the chat. David Johnson says, can you talk more about the video light you use and the Fresnel light you use? Sure. Um, so I uh, use a couple of different lights. Uh, for the exterior lights, um, I use a little panel light that runs on battery. Um, it has dimming features, uh, brightness, darkness, and also has uh, color temperature uh, changes on it as well. Um, it's very important if we're trying to match a specific color uh, to something outside. Sometimes if there's other lights that are happening like garage lights that are slightly dim color, we can adjust to be the same. Um, but if we're doing our Milky Way stuff, I can dim it down pretty low as well as putting a, a softener on it to re when you're out there with your pure eyes, it doesn't look like it's illuminating anything. But when you do the nighttime pictures, that very subtle light makes a huge difference in the world. And then for the, you know, when we're trying to create a Fresnel lens, um, I have these small single chip uh, battery Fresnel lenses that we use, and I put uh, Fresnel lens adapters on there with the barn doors. Um, actually, I can, you know, I share my screen for a second. Sure, you can go ahead. Uh, lens lightings. So this is uh, this is one of the lights that we used. Actually, this is recently at uh, Point Arena. And Mark's lighthouse there, and um, it's not the sharpest picture, but um, single chip Fresnel lenses with these adjustable Fresnel lens uh, lenses on here, and you can put barn doors on there to kind of really direct the light and block it from going other places, and, and um, so I I just use a regular tripod and made a custom uh, plate mount and then put these four lights on there, um. Depending on what lighthouse we're at, we'll either put two, three, four, five, depending on what we can do. Um, or if the Fresnel lens is already up there, um, we'll put a light bulb inside that's battery powered. And um, just you don't want to put a Fresnel lens in a Fresnel lens. It, you just need the the light source itself. And so going when we did this at Point uh, Cape Mears in Oregon, the the location of the light, the where the light bulb had to be, it's it's extremely precise where it needs to be. Um, yeah, when we first put it in there, um, it looked nice, but something just was off on it. We could just tell it was a little bright on one side versus the other. So me moving it up like three inches and maybe four inches to the left, it it really intensified the entire lens. That that sweet spot i don't know what the exact term with that would be where the light needs to be within the the lens um I'm trying to think what that name would be um uh wherever whatever the term would be that light bulb has to be dead center of the fresnel lens and that's something we we learned you know firsthand Sorry, Pete. I got distracted. I was uh, Jeff got kicked out of the uh, event by by I think he lost his internet connection or something. So okay. I, was, I was answering a message from him. You're talking about the the center of the lens where the light has the you light were... has to be right in the center of the lens. Is that yeah? What's the term of that? What would that uh, the fo be? focal plane of the light is the center of the lens? Yeah. yeah. So they they'll say the focal plane of the light is 
a hundred feet above the the water or that right kind of thing. yeah yeah we just found that literally that light bulb if it's off by a couple inches up or down or left or right it it really makes a difference in the intensity of the, the overall lens so we went through a couple of adjustments we we got cape mirrors to look pretty good um let's see i Oh, uh, John Potvin, who's uh, very involved with the Chesapeake chapter of the U.S. Lighthouse Society, mentions that I'm going down that way in May. I'm making a trip down the coast in May, New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland, and John is going to get me out to uh, t uh, Thomas Point Shoal, mm -hmm. and he asks uh, maybe you, Pete, could come mm -hmm. out as well. I don't know what you're doing around the middle of May. I forget. That. Um, I don't have the date right in front of me, but we, we we can we can chat after this. I'll see what my schedule is. I mean, more it's it's only a couple hours, two uh, two and a half hours for me to get down to Annapolis or wherever we would go out of. From. So yeah, we can talk. I'd be more than happy to go on out there. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll let you know the date again. So, again, okay. I don't have that schedule right in front of me, or maybe John knows uh, the date off the top of his head. So Jeff just made it back in. Hi, Jeff. I'll, I'll put myself out there. If there's any other lighthouse owners that want me to come out and do some pictures, I'd be more than happy to just get hold of Jeremy to get hold of me or whatever. I'd be more than happy to do some pictures. It's it's always fun to photograph lighthouses at nighttime. Mm -hmm. uh, any other uh, questions, comments? Uh, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I think Mike's being sarcastic here. Sorry to come in late. Can Pete start over from the beginning? Is this somebody you know, uh, Pete? Mike Castello? <laughs> the name is very familiar. I, I <laughs> okay. it's, 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 Yeah. <laughs> I um, don't think he means that seriously. Um, uh, I do want to say, um, I do want to thank you, um, Jeff Gales, Chad Kaiser, Bob Trapani, Terry, and Mark, and anyone else who's been helpful with allowing me and our group of photographers to get all the special access. We really appreciate it because obviously we couldn't do it without your help. And it's, it's, it's a lot of fun and we appreciate it. And, you know, it's a big thank you to you guys because we couldn't do it without you. Well, I'd like to, to respond to that, Pete, that any of anyone on this uh, presentation who is part of managing a lighthouse like Jeff and I are, um, I can't speak highly enough about Pete as being very respectful, very professional, um, and doing everything the right way. And you would never have to worry about opening your light station to him for either his own shooting or the seminars that he runs. Uh, you will not remember. Thank you for saying that, Mark, because that goes along with everything I've heard about Pete and everything I know about Pete. So uh, Thank you. I, I concur. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's very nice to see you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, just a, a few things I want to mention before we kind of wind down for today. Uh, I'll just mention the tours again on the USLHS website, uslhs.org. Uh, if you haven't been on the website in a while, check it out because the website was revamped not that long ago. So uh, there's all kinds of resources on there. There's a lot about the passport program. I know a lot of you are into that. But check out the uh, tours. Uh, again, the main tour I'll be co-leading in October. I also mentioned this, of course, is the 40th anniversary of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. And Jeff, I think we may have lost Jeff again. I think his internet connection is going in and out. But um, Jeff and I will be uh, putting together, this is a, this is kind of a, a sneak uh preview here that uh, we haven't really said this publicly yet, but we're working on sort of a telethon type event that'll be actually a virtual event uh, sometime over the summer, probably in August. So watch for more word about that. Uh, our next scheduled virtual event like this will be on Saturday, May 4th. It'll be a special remembrance of two members of our USLHS family who passed away last year. Phil Borkowski and Tom Chisholm. So I know there's a lot of people here who who knew uh, Phil and Tom. So you want to check that out on uh, May 4th. So I think that brings us, oh, May 15th. John Poffin says it's May 15th that I'm scheduled to go out there. So Pete, if there's any chance you can make it that day, that would be really fun. So. Yeah, I'll double check on that and uh, I'll let you know. Mm-hmm. So I'll mention again, this will be on YouTube, uh, I think by sometime on Monday, if not, certainly by Tuesday. 
So go to YouTube and, and search for USLHS, find the YouTube channel. There's a lot on there. There's hundreds of videos on there. So I recommend you check that out. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, a week from this Sunday and the Sunday after that will be the two-part interview on my, my podcast with uh, Wayne Wheeler, the founder of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. So you don't want to miss that. Uh, and I think that about brings us to the end here. Pete, I want to thank you so much mm -hmm. that, you know, I just love looking at your photographs and obviously everybody here loved it. I did so many good comments in the chat there. Uh, thank so you. this is a real, real treat. We did the podcast interview earlier and I thought, well, we really should do something more visual because it's nice to talk about photography in a, like a podcast, but it's better mm -hmm. if you can see it. So appreciate uh, that. If funny. you have a moment, if I can just show some of the other historical... Oh, right. I'm glad you said that, Pete. <laughs> no, no problem. Sorry. Let's not end this yet. Yeah. Um, I want to give you a chance to show a little bit of your other other work before we yeah. side out here. So go go ahead, Pete. Take, to, okay. take it. Yeah. I'll make it real quick just to kind of... So I love photographing history. And um, this all ties into, you know, the human aspect of everything and just it's overall history of everything. So... Um, Various other things we photograph, uh, just a couple of montages here. We do a lot of aviation photography. Um, I work with several museums during their air shows. Uh, we do the lighting. Uh, they'll bring some of their airplanes out and fire up the engines. Um, we do a lot of reenactments. I'm friends with a lot of reenactors, and I'm reenacting myself. Um, so we'll get reenactors together, and we'll have them in full uh, historic uniforms or clothing and have them pose with airplanes. Uh, we even do air-to-air -air photography. Uh, which is it, probably the most ex expensive and crazy thing we do, but it, it's it's an incredible experience to be in an airplane with another airplane. So, um, do a lot of landscape and wildlife uh, landscape. I'm sorry, workshops with landscape and wildlife. Um, we were just in Monument Valley a few weeks ago. Um, one of my the first subject I was doing the photography workshops was with the railroads. Um, I've loved trains my whole life, and now I get to go out on the trains and essentially tell them what to do for us. So um, get some really, really good pictures. Met a lot of nice people doing it. And um, we do a lot of World War II themed stuff, specifically Rosie the Riveter. Um, the two stuff we do with uh, aviation or with uh, steam railroading. A lot of these outfits are historically accurate um, or even like the real deal, not even reproduction stuff. But um, they allow us to work with the airplanes and the trains and get some good stuff. And then uh, we do um, we work with a couple of families out in Monument Valley for the Navajo, Navajo Nation shoots. And we do some Wild West stuff as well. Um, it's one of my favorite times, uh, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s uh, photo shoot stuff. And then we do a lot of uh, World War II stuff as well. Um I cover several big events as well as uh, put on my own private photo shoots. Um, these two were on the battleship, New Jersey. Um, this is a friend of mine, Johnny does Tuskegee airmen. Um, these were taken during the D-Day Conneaut event where they have the largest world war II event in the country on the beach of uh, Conneaut, Ohio. Um, they have uh, armor that comes out as well. There's some aviation stuff. These are friends of mine that do, uh, the portraits for me and uh yeah it's just a little little scheme of everything else we like to do it's not just lighthouses but lighthouses is one of the most favorite things i like to do um but we we just don't shoot lighthouses we shoot a whole bunch of other stuff it all you know ties in somehow with you know lighting instruction and so forth so i can't hear you I have myself muted while you were there talking. You thank you. Yeah, I was no just problem. saying, I thank you for prompting me on that because we certainly meant to have you uh, talk about your other work, and that was actually part of Jeff's job. But then he uh, he lo he lost his internet connection there. So no, that's all right. I, I I didn't want to make it like a thing until the very end. Just I didn't want to make it a, a big thing. Just wanted to throw it in there if I could. So the other work is is incredible. The uh, the reenactment stuff is so cool. It's really yeah. so cool. Nobody yeah. else. It, it, there may be other people doing similar stuff, but I don't know of anybody else taking it to that that extent. No, um, I mean, we we we. I think I'm the only one really doing the full reenactment stuff like that. I mean, some people do some other stuff with trains and so forth, but uh. 
the overall everything we done i think i'm the only one that's really doing all that stuff all in one place so yeah uh, if anyone's ever interested they can visit the website larophotography.com and uh click on the contact button just shoot me an email i can put you on the list for all of our announcements and uh, lighthouse wise um we are working we're talking with the east point lighthouse about doing a photo workshop with them um we are hoping to get out to thatcher island and uh hoping to go up to maine sometime soon um as you mentioned earlier we're going to montauk next week and uh we, we usually do at least one two or even three different lighthouse workshops a year various boat rides uh nighttime access lighthouse keeper shoots it's uh depends on what we can schedule and come up with so if anyone's ever interested in coming on out with us to an adventure to go photograph some lighthouses out at sea and uh it, the one thing with our boats is that we're not going out with like a general public boat we charter the boat with like a fishing company so we're, we're leaving at four in the morning so we can get out to a lighthouse at dawn we're not leaving at nine in the morning coming back at three in the afternoon this is a photo driven gig so there's you know it's always be up before sunset and we're going to bed after sun or be up before sunrise going to bed after sunset because it's we're there to take pictures it's midday we're not doing very much so it's it's definitely not a pampered trip at all yeah well it just makes me think of the the phrase that i don't know what percentage you'd say but a good part of photography is being in the right place at the right time it the is. other half is a combination of technical knowledge and skill uh, and you certainly have all that, you know, obviously you're a master of the technical aspects of uh, night photography and everything else, but what makes it special is you always, you also have a great artistic eye for the stuff. So bringing those together, I think is what makes your photography special. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. You're very yeah, welcome. A huge part of it's just, you got to be in the right place at the right time. You got to put yourself out there. If you stay home, you'll never get the picture. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's in life. The most important thing yeah. is being in the right place at the right time. That is correct. Yeah. So, Jeff, are you back, fully back with us? I don't know if you want to say anything else before we sign off here. I'm back. I'm back, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and... No, thank you, Pete. Now, not only does Pete does is a great photographer, but he's very uh, generous with his work. He always lets the Lighthouse Society and other nonprofit groups use his images for fundraising and for marketing purposes. And so he does... Uh, not only does great work, he's a good guy too. I appreciate that. And I wasn't sure if you were there when I, I thanked you and everybody else for allowing us to do these things because we wouldn't be able to get a lot of these pictures without your help and generosity and you know giving us the time to do that. So mm -hmm. we appreciate everything you've done for us and looking forward to working with you guys some more. And Pete also takes a great drone video, which uh, you've uh, donated to the U.S. Lighthouse Society as well for various what, uses. So What's that? I'm sorry drone video you've donated the use of uh, a lot of your lighthouse drone video mm -hmm. uh, for the society to use so yeah i wanted to thank you for that too no, no problem it, whatever whatever helps the society we're we're here to want to keep you guys going and any way i can help in doing that because without the societies and the museums that we wouldn't have the lighthouses so mm -hmm. I just want to say, Melissa uh, just made a good comment related to what we were just saying. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take works here as well. That's so, correct. <laughs> that's a good gotta, way to put you it. You got to get out there. Yeah. So at the, at this point, I think we can kind of wind down for today. So thank you again, Pete. The, I knew it was going to be great. It was even greater than I imagined. Well, uh, thank you. So hopefully. We'll I, I, some... I was kind of nervous because I'm like, I, I don't know what to really show or I mean, we, we we talk about just narrowing it down just to the nighttime stuff, not my daytime stuff. And I'm like, which direction I do I just show everything? I, I didn't know like to specifically. Uh, I thought of a couple different directions, but I'm like, I'll just show them all. <laughs> Why not? And just kind of a little bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we can do it again sometime and talk more about your daytime photography as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. You know, I, I see Mike's comment there. I, I knew that name was familiar. <laughs> He's been on a couple of the, the train shoots. So, uh, but uh, it's, you know, like going back to what we were saying, it's as long as you just put yourself out there, you never know what you're going to get. And that's why I like shooting in all weather, not just one thing or another. You just take what gets you and get a good picture. Yeah, there you go. That's the bottom line. So yeah. thank you again, Pete. Thanks, Jeff, for being here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, for being part of our event today. Hope to see you at our next event that I was uh, just telling you about on May 4th. 
Don't forget to listen to the podcast. New episode every Sunday, lighthearted. And uh, we'll see you next time. So thank you so much and keep a good light. Me too. Thank, thank you very much. You very much.